in the house, eh? Those words that came through just around that God's in the, in the process, you know, he's in the business of resurrection, eh? And he's in the business of installing hope and, uh, and joy and uh, that, but we've got to lean into it. We've got to step into it. We've got to carry it, um, not just on Sunday, but right through every day of the week. And I just encourage you, I believe that, you know, those words coming through, it's, that's it's sort of, the Lord's saying, you know, it's despite the storms that, he, you know, he's with us. And often it's in those places where we're the most, uh, when we're the most undone, that it's like we know uh, his presence in, in, in such a real way. And so I just encourage you to just uh, grab onto those words that were coming through there. They're for you. And, and f- it fits in, actually, with uh, where we are in Mark, in Mark 14. And it's the, it's the Passover, the final meal, the last meal that Jesus has with his disciples. And so they're in this place, and actually Jesus is in this place of like, he knows what's ahead, you know, and yet he carries this incredible peace and, uh, with him and and. and and what he unpacks with them in that Last Supper is so profound. And I, I want to link it in with uh, uh, the historical Passover. And, and, and that gives it a lot of context of, of what Jesus was saying and why, it, um, and why it meant so much. I don't know about you, but uh, think about the, your favorite meal that you've ever had. Like your favorite dinner. Uh, or maybe it's a lunch, you know, it's a... And so it's sort of a combo of three things, I think. You know, it's, it's obviously it's the food, uh, but, but it's the fellowship as well. And a meal by yourself is like pretty dull, you know, but you want to have, you want to have friends and family there, don't you? And, and, it's, and so maybe it was a celebration, maybe it was a birthday, or it was uh, just catching up with friends, people we haven't seen for a long time. Uh, and then the third is the venue. You know, it's gotta, and you've got to have a great venue, don't you, where that's... It's, um, where it's, it's warm and it's inviting, it's, it, it, it uh, encourages fellowship, etc. And you sort of need those three things. And, and so this is the meal, this is Jesus' last meal with the people who were closest with, the 12 disciples. Um, and they're in Jerusalem, the day of the Passover. So this would have been the Thursday evening meal and uh, right before uh, the Sabbath, which was you know, on the Friday, the Friday sundown. And so for them, for the Jewish people I was sharing last week, but this was probably like the main event on the calendar. This was the, you know, the dinner of all dinners and the, to celebrate and to remember um, historically the birth of the nation. And so it, was, it would have been a thousand years before Christ, right, that, uh, that they were in slavery, that the nation was in slavery in Egypt. 400 years that they were in slavery when Joseph brought them, you know, saved them from the drought and brought his father Jacob and his family and they, and they rested and they, they were sheltered in Egypt. Um, but then that turned into slavery and they were held there hostage. Um, and so there was no, no sense of hope. That was a death sentence. You're, you're going to be a slave till you drop dead. And that was it. They had no hope and they were wondering, where's God and all this? And, uh, and of course... God raises up Moses and Aaron, right? And he sends these plagues through him, through them, uh, and culminate, culminating in this uh, divine justice with the, the angel of death that would pass over um, every house in Egypt. And this is, this is the instructions that, uh, that God said through Moses to the, tell the people, and it's in Exodus 12, uh, just uh, a few verses here. He says, on the same night, this is God speaking, is, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and I will see the blood, and I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is the day you are to commemorate for the generations to come, you shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. And if you know the story, he was, they were told, they were instructed to take a lamb, a, you know, a, a, um, a pure lamb, um, a firstborn, a male, and to sacrifice it. 
and to put the blood on the lintel, which is the top of the, wall, uh, of the door frame, and then down the, and sprinkle the blood on the door frames. And that was the, as an act, um, and that was the only thing that was going to uh, cause them to be, to be passed over by the angel of death. And I was reading about it, and it, it struck, uh, the commentators were saying, again, it's like, so it didn't matter if you were the king or a slave. It didn't matter if you're an Egyptian or a Jew, unless you put your faith right in that lamb, in that sacrificial lamb, and in, a, in an act of faith, you, you, you know, sacrificed it and you put the blood on it, um, someone was going to die in your household. And it didn't matter. The Jewish people weren't exempt. They had to do this. And I'm, no doubt there were probably some who didn't. And so either the angel passed over the, uh, the house or the firstborn was struck dead. And so there's this sense that actually you had to put your faith in a substitute. And if you did that, then death passed over you. And you and your family were saved. And that's how God freed the nation from Egypt. Out of that, out of that, that one night, you know, Pharaoh just said, go. He just, and could you imagine what that must have been like? You know, they had their bags packed and they got told, you just go, get out. You know, and that was the birth of their nation. And they went from being from slavery to walking this journey into the promised land. And, to, and they had to fight many more battles, of, uh, if you know the story. But that was the moment where they were freed from slavery. And it's sort of the question then, it's like, why, did, why a lamb? You know, why, why, why this sacrifice? Why, why this little fluffy you know, animal? Why did, why did God choose that? And, of course, and the answer is that actually it was a prophetic type. It was a metaphor. It was a sign of, of something to come that actually that was planned before the end of this, the beginning of time itself, that actually God had a way. And, and that's why the first, uh, in John 1, 27, when, when John the Baptist first saw Jesus and he said, the next day John saw it, this is when Jesus, uh, John was baptizing in the, in, in the, um, the Jordan, he says, next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him, and he said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Isn't that awesome? It all overlaps and interlinks and it unfolds in, and you can see the Bible doesn't contradict itself. It just builds this layer and layer and layer. And, uh, and when we look back, we can see the pattern. And so this meal of grace that we're up to, this, the, the Passover meal, which turned into, you know, the, the, the first communion. It, it turned into the Lord's Supper um, for those who believed. And, and it came out of this meal that, uh, that Jesus presided over, his last meal with his disciples. So let's read in, in chapter 14, uh, 12 to 26. It says, On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So you remember, like, the place was packed probably three times the population of, of uh, Jerusalem, the crowds that were there. So, that there's, you know, unless you'd book something in advance, you're in trouble. And so it was a big deal for them. And so Jesus, uh, he sent two, two of his disciples telling them, go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. And say to the owner of the house, he enters. The teacher asks, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. The disciples left, went into the city, and found the things just as Jesus had told them. Told him. So they prepared the Passover. And so now we come to the actual Passover, the meal. And, and notice that, so there's a, a marquee in the sandwich, the ABA, you know, pattern again. So see if you can spot it. So continuing on, it says, that when Jesus, uh, sorry, when evening came, Jesus arrived with the 12. While they were reclining at the table eating, he said, truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. 
And they were saddened, and one by one they said to him, Surely you don't mean me. It is one of the twelve, he replied, one who dips bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. And while they were eating, Jesus took the bread, and when he gave thanks, had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he got up, uh, sorry, <laughs> then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly, I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. You will fall away, Jesus told them, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. And Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. Truly I tell you, Jesus answered, today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all of the others said the same. So it's a, it's a, a passage and a last meal that was loaded with tension and, and, and with unanswered questions, really, and, and foreboding. Like, what, what's Jesus talking? They still, they really, although he had mentioned it multiple times, he had prophesied three times before to them publicly that he was going to die, that he was going to be betrayed, they still really don't have any kind of idea of what's going on. And in that first section there from 12 to 16, you know, it's sort of, it, it's, when I read it, I sort of thought, what, like, why has Mark included it? Why has he included all this, this prophetic word that, that Jesus had that was so specific about, you know, the, part, the location where he's going to take the Passover? And, uh, and he said that, you know, you're going to find a guy who's going to be carrying a jar of water. And, and that, that was rare in the days. Um, that, was, that was generally a, a woman's job or a servant's job. And so he, could have been, he would have been picked out really easily. It was, so it was a very specific prophetic word. And, but why include it? Why is it so important? You know, that Jesus is about to go to the cross and it includes this, this wee passage. But Mark evidently did. He, you know, it was for him. He felt that that was he needed. It needed to be put in. And actually, when you read it, it it, ha, it has the same sort of rhythm as the um, as what happened when Jesus entered into Jerusalem. That he sent two disciples in. They were on this covert mission, and and he he said, "You're going to find this donkey, and you're going to take take that donkey. It's going to be tethered, and that's the donkey I'm going to ride in." And so there's a sense of that it's going to fulfill prophetic the prophecy. It was that actually that Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen. You see, and he he was not. It was not a situation that he was out of control. And actually, I, uh, actually, Teresa mentioned it this morning is that he submitted to the authorities, but he was in authority the whole time. He honoured that authority, but. He, there's no sense of desperation, of fear and anger, or of um, that that he's been sucked into this sort of vortex. You know, like you think of like when you're a, I remember when I was a kid, you know, with peer pressure, and you sort of you don't say anything, and you and then suddenly you find yourself in a situation, and you think, oh flip, how did I get here? I'm trapped. I've got no way out. There's no sense of that with Jesus. It's like he knows the way ahead, and he's walking it, and there's no fear. There's no panic in him. And uh, it speaks of this, uh, to the absolute authority that he, that he has and that he's going about his father's business and he knows what's ahead, uh, but yet he's walking towards it. And uh, it's, it reminded me of, I was thinking about that and, and uh, the picture, I remember on the holidays myself and Daniel, we went rafting. And we, were, uh, we went in Rotorua and it was on a, a father... Uh, a parent-child camp, and we got to uh, go on the, uh, one of the rivers that comes out of Lake Rotorua, 
and apparently it's the highest waterfall that you are commercially allowed to raft down in the world. It's a seven metre drop, and, there's, and this is the only one in the world where you are actually, they're, they're allowed to operate. And, and, and we like jump in this raft, you know, and man, it's like grade three plus, so it's big white water, you know, and, and you've got the guide at the back and seven of us in the raft, and, and midway down, you, you know, you're going over these rapids and he's telling you all about, you know, this massive waterfall ahead and, um, and, and he's like, oh, hey, there's the last corner, this is the, the path, and he's like, this is the path of shame if you want to get out. And, uh, and these, right, these guides are like, yeah, we'll pick you up, you know, tomorrow, you know, and, and they, were, they were hilarious, you know, but what you realize that midway down, it's like these guides, they were in total control. Like they had rafted this river for years and years and years. They knew every whirlpool. They knew every current. They knew exactly if you fell out here, where were you going to pop out? And, and although it felt like you were in this, you know, um, chaos of this turbulent w- river, actually these guides, they just knew exactly what was going on and they steered these rafts and it, and it was incredible. And that's the picture that you sort of, that, that Jesus is like, you look on this, you think, what is going on? The disciples must have been just not, sh- just didn't know what was going on. And, and yet Jesus did, he knew. And he was calm despite the fact that he was about to go through the crucifixion. And so this, this tension is building. And we get to the second section, and it's got this, I was saying, the, the, this, the Markovian, the Markian sort of sandwich, this ABA, um, that pattern that's, in, that's been repeated right throughout the whole uh, mark. And, and so it says that when Jesus came, he arrived with the 12, and they were reclining and they were eating. And, and he, re, he, re, he tells them again that I'm going to be portrayed, um, that it's going to be one of you that's eating with me. And it, so he had repeated it. And, and it's interesting that, that the responses, actually, it's almost like they're saddened, but they're like, ah, oh. you know, they lean over. It's, Jesus, is it, you know, is it me? You know, and, uh, and, he, and he's, he just says, no, it's going to be one of you who, who, who's eating, you know, with, with me. So it, uh, he doesn't say who it is explicitly. And, he, and, it, and it, you can see that they're, you know, they're like thinking, oh, flip, you know, Am I the one? You know, and so there's, there's a self-centeredness in it. You know, it's not so much about Jesus. It's like, you know, <laughs> is it me? Or, a phew, no, looks like it's not. I'm okay, you know. I'm, it's like each to their own. There's already the splintering that's happening in people's hearts, you know, that the, I, I know what it's, it's the same at school or, at this, you know, when someone, the teacher's like, right, who was it, you know, and you're suddenly thinking, oh, shoot, uh, you run through it and you think, am I in trouble? Is it, is it me? Is it? Uh, and there's that sense that this is what's happening in the, um, uh, with the disciples. And then Jesus makes this really uh, quite a profound statement. And he says of Judas, you know, that actually that it would have been better, you know, woe to the person who, who betrays me. It would be better if they had never lived. And actually, you know, if you were ever wondering in, in, about this, human free will and how it works. Are we responsible for our actions? And, but if Jesus knows all things, is, is it all then just God knows all things? You know, he's omniscient. Does that mean that we're robots operating? You know, and, and actually this verse makes it really clear that that's not the case, that, his, that God knows all things, but within preserving human free will. Actually, it says even in John that Satan entered Judas when he was about to betray him. And that, but yet here, Jesus himself says, man, it's woe, woe to Judas, you know, woe to the one who betrays me. It would have been better if he had never lived. And so that's a so, you know, it's a sobering thought that, man, that we are all accountable for our decisions that we make. No matter what our history is in our past, is actually at the end of the day, we're responsible for our own actions, um, as was Judas. And so Jesus in verse uh, 22 there, he says that while they were eating, Jesus took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, take it, this is my body. 
And it's important to know that the so the Passover meal was it was a um, still it was a lamb, a lamb that was roasted on the spit, um, and that and there was a there was a uh, a set sort of four stages to the to having this Passover meal, and and so and it was you know the imagery was looking back to the you know what happened in Egypt, the remembrance, the thankfulness for what Jesus did, uh, so what the the Lord did, what Yahweh did, in freeing them from slavery, but Jesus now he he goes off track. He goes off the formula, and he says, "You know, take it this that this is my body." And he takes the cup, and when he had given thanks, and he said to, uh, and he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. He said to them. Truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new from the kingdom of God. Uh, sorry, in the kingdom of God. And again, Jesus is using this Old Testament imagery and of the Passover of, um, and also of right back to Mount Sinai uh, when, right, when, when they had brought the Israelites out of the slavery and they were in the desert and at the bottom of Mount Sinai at they, uh, Moses explained the law to the people, and he said, you know, uh, that God had brought them out of slavery, and he brought, and he said that you'll be my God, and sorry, I'll be your God, and you'll be my people, and they all agreed and said, yes, Amen, we'll follow. What this is it, you know, we're we're um, we're a hundred percent, and what they did is they made a blood covenant, the people as a nation, uh, and it's in Exodus twenty four. Verse 8, it says, Then Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and listen to this. He said, This is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with these words. The same phrase. It's the only place where it's used. And so Jesus is, is going right back to there. And, he's, and, the, and we think of these covenants, you know, and they sound like... Uh, it sounds weird, doesn't it? And, it is, and you sort of think, what's the significance of it? Well, a blood covenant was something, it's saying that on, on pain of death, I will not break this covenant. And so an animal was, was sacrificed and the, and the blood was sprinkled over both parties. And it's like they're saying, I'm making a blood covenant with you that's saying that on my death, I am never going to break this. That is the strength of it. And so it, had, it was about the most, the strongest way that you can make an oath. And, and so they, are, and of course, if you know the story, then at that point, Moses went up the mountain and he uh, received the Ten Commandments. And they didn't even last the 40 days. <laughs> it says that, they, that they, uh, they got bored. They thought, oh, Moses is, you know, has, we've lost him. And they're like, uh, Aaron, make some calves and we'll worship them. They'll be our God. And so it's like it, they didn't even last. You know the 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 time, forty days after that uh, blood covenant that they've made, and they and they they screw up, so someone's got to die. And so Jesus here is going, you know what? It's my blood. Even though you screwed up, this is going to be my blood and my body broken for you. And so he marries these that Exodus scripture, and also in Isaiah 53, and it says that he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. By his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. The Lord has laid, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And then if we fast forward to verse 12, it says, he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgression. So this pouring out of his blood and, the, and the, the symbolism of the blood covenant, of a new covenant that's being made, and not of a lamb, but of actually that, that God, that Jesus is going to sacrifice himself as the pure, as the um, unblemished lamb for, for you and I. And so, can you see, and it's, and it's sandwiched between the, uh, previously that sandwich was between the, in the 
last week in, chapter, in this first part of chapter 14, it was between the, the Jewish leaders scheming and Judas betraying him. And this time, it's between the, uh, not just now, the um, Jesus prophesying again that, the, that, the, um, that Judas is you know, going to betray, but also that they're all going to leave and they're all going to abandon him. And, and that, that word all was so strong. It's like, you're all going to leave. You're all going to betray me. N- none of you are a whole lot better than Judas. It, that when pu- push comes to shove, um, you're all going to bolt and you're all going to abandon. And in the middle, he's saying, but even though I know that, I'm going to give my all for you. I'm going to pour out my body and my blood for you. Um, and the word all, uh, the body, it's, he's saying not just by physical body, he's saying it's his his everything he has, I'm going to give it for you. And, and it's incredible that, you see, that, that Passover lamb, he's, we often think about it for the world, but actually he's saying, I'm, I'm giving it for you, the 12 around the table right now. You're all going to bail on me. You're all going to betray me. You're all going to leave me and abandon me. And yet despite what is, you know, the... the Cowardice, the, um, the, um, the weakness around the table, the sin around the table, the, you know, the fact that, that Peter's like, but Jesus, I'm, I'll never, you know, it's quite funny the language he used. He's like, he's sort of implying like, they're all probably going to abandon. Yeah, that's true, but I'm never going to do it. You know, there's this emotional kind of like, uh, you know, egotistical thing that's coming through, it's like, man, yeah, they're all going to abandon you, but, but I won't, because I'm the, I'm the best disciple you got, you know, and he doesn't even know his own heart, he doesn't know what's in, in his own heart, and despite all that, despite all that around the table, Jesus is saying, you know what, I'm going to give my all for you, and so all of these layers of, of Old Testament uh, imagery, of the Passover, of the sacrifice of the Lamb, um, and of the, as Jesus takes all that and being the Passover meal, and he changes it and, and, it, and speaks of the fulfillment of all those, uh, the, the hope of the nation, the hope of a Messiah, and he angles it and changes it um, into him. And so for the Jewish people, Passover was the birth of the nation. It was the freedom from slavery. It was the, um, it was the promised land. But for for us as believers in Christ, it, the Passover gets completely changed and re-imaged. And that actually, that was the, the commemoration of what Jesus did on the cross. That actually, that he was uh, the final lamb. He was the one who, uh, not just for a nation, but for all people, that he uh, poured out his blood for you and I. He, he restored and uh, the relationship between God and man, he allowed us to be able to have a relationship with him again because he took all the iniquities, he took all the sin, uh, what was Jewish, Jewish, he uh, took on that punishment. So this this just the sense of um, of the sacrificial love that that God had for us, that Jesus had for us, and that He laid down His life for you and I, um, is all layered in to the communion that we had this morning. That actually the invitation is to a to a meal of grace, you know, for all who are unworthy. The disciples were unworthy. You know, they, they sat around, and as Teresa was saying, they, they saw him, they, they were sat with him in the flesh, you know, and in the same way we uh, come around, and it's not because of anything that we have done, but it's because of the grace and this incredible love, the sacrificial love that he had for each one of us. And, you know, I mean, true love is always self-sacrificing. It is, it's, and it's, 
and it, it costs. And, and you all know that. We, we do it all the time. Um, and we have experiences of, of that self-sacrificing love, and we are to model that in our own lives. And, and I, so I was, for example, I remember friends of ours who lived up in Picton, one, and they bought a beautiful, nice new lawnmower, you know. And uh, neighbours asked, oh, can we borrow it? You know, we haven't got a lawnmower. And uh, they, were, they were beneficiaries, you know, that didn't have a lot of funds, et cetera, and so they didn't have a lawnmower of their own. And so, oh, yeah, sure. You know, and and they're sitting, and they were sitting having lunch, and that, and then and they heard this horrendous noise, you know, and looked out the window, and and these guys were uh, mowing their lawn, but they were just driving over the concrete footpath, you know, and so the blades would go smack into the concrete and down the other side, and uh, and this mower was just got totaled, it was got bent up, the drive shaft got you know got knackered and. And then they just, they, they returned it, oh, thanks for the mower. And, uh, and th- there was no mention of the damage done or anything, they just handed it back. And, and I'm thinking, man, what do we do? You know, do we, they can't pay for it. Like, are we going to show grace? Are we just going to, are we going to, you see, self-sacrificing means that you pay the cost, that you take the hit. For, and that's hard. So self-sacrificial love uh, takes the risk of, of it being abused. And I know that's and man, that's hard. I don't know. And self-sacrifice, I, you know, it's 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 like at school when the new kid comes, or when the kid who who stinks, you know, who who smells. No one likes them. And you think, you know what, I'm just going to go out, I'll go out and hang with them. And you see the sneers and the, you know, and, but yeah, but you sacrifice spending time with your mates to, to love that person and to connect with them. See, self-sacrifice, it, it means that you pay a cost. That's true love. Timothy Keller, he, um, he was reading, he shares a story that he read in the National Geographic. And uh, it's a story from uh, Yellowstone National Park and the wildfires that they have there. And, and anyway, the, apparently one area had a, had a massive you know, fire and burnt um, hundreds of hectares. And anyway, two park rangers thought, right, we're going to head up, go check out and survey the damage. And they're walking up this mountain to get to the, you know, a view to see what had happened and see how the extent of the fire and um, and so they were walking up this mountain and and they said they came across this really grotesque uh, you know image before them and and they found at the base of a tree this bird that had it was it had its wings spread out and it had com- been completely just carbonized just been utterly you know, burnt to a crisp. There was nothing left of it uh, apart from sort of like the form of the ashes. Um, sort of, they could see where the wings are and the bones and, and it was just carbonized sitting there. And, and, and they looked at that and I thought, man, imagine the heat that caused that bird, you know, that, that it, it ended up in that state. And one of the rangers kicked it and, you know, used a stick and sort of pushed, flipped it over. And to their horror... To their shock, actually, amazement, little chicks scurried out. See, that's, that is the self-sacrificing love. That, that bird actually stayed, gave its life for these little chicks, and it got burnt to a, to a cinder, carbonized. But it's, it was steadfast, and it, and it stayed in that fire and to protect you know, its, its young. And that's a great metaphor of what Jesus did in that first Passover. That, that everyone else abandoned, everybody else scurried away, everybody else ran from the fire. But Jesus didn't. And he walked through and he did it for you and I. He did it for those disciples who were around the table, who in their weakness and in their insecurities and that under pressure, they all abandoned, they all caved. But Jesus didn't. He gave it all for you and I. And just to finish, there's this amazing, you know, verse that in the midst of all of what's going on, 
right? And it can't have been a, you know, it's not like a woohoo, that's party sort of celebration, is it? You know, it's, it must have been pretty foreboding. But even in, in that situation, in verse 25 there, Jesus says that truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. So he sees the eternal hope. He sees the eternal fruit of what he's doing. That actually, that this world is passing away, but, but he can see the bigger picture that even though he's gonna, he is going to give his all and sacrifice, that, that actually that, that we will all one day are invited to that feast in heaven, that feast in eternity. And what a, <laughs> like what a feast it's going to be. It speaks that, that even the rocks and the trees and the, and the animals are going are gonna to cry out in glory to God. You know, like, it's all dormant at the moment. You know, it's not, we don't see trees dancing. And, you know, it's not like, but it's like one day, it's like the whole of creation is going to be made new. It's like every single heart desire that you have that, that you deep down longing for love, for, for um, wholeness, for, uh, for value, for intimacy, for uh, worth. It's everything in your heart is going to be completely fulfilled on that day. That we can look forward to it. Timothy Keller, he, um, he was sort of like giving this picture at the... Uh, this book I was reading, and, and he was saying, imagine what it would be like if, if you met a Jewish person, an Israelite, right, in Egypt in that night that they were freed, you know, and you're like, and you ask them, what are you doing? Who are you? You know, because you, you know, their response would have been, man, I was a slave. I had no hope. I had no future. I was, my, myself and my family were destined to just, to be in slavery for our whole life, generation after generation. But now we're free. We've been, we're off to the promised land, baby. We are gone, you know. We're grabbing everything we have and we're, we're, we're going to go. And, and actually, it's a land flying of milk and honey. And it's a land that all our promises, that we're going to be with God. He's going to, he's for us and we're going to know him. We're going to walk in his presence. And that is the same hope in the future that we have. It's a great picture of what the Christian life is, that, that actually, that our journey, um, where we put our faith in, that's, that substitutory sacrifice of what Jesus did, that he spread his wings out, and he took the divine punishment, that that, that punishment passed over you and I and kept us safe, and that we were, uh, that we are free from the, the, the bondage of slavery, of sin, and of ultimately of death, that actually we have eternal life in him and through him. And we're all invited to that table. You know, it's a table of grace. It's not for all the unworthy, you know, the unworthy disciples and, and down right down through the generation. For, for every generation, it's for you and I. And we've just got to say yes and amen. We've got to, it's not a token thing, but it, it's like the... What the, the first people in the Passover did, they, they put their faith in that lamb and they believed in it and they walked in it and they uh, lived their life this journey to the promised land. And so do we. Every day we have the choice of coming back again and again and saying, God, thank you for what you did on the cross. Thank you for your blood. And Lord, help me today to walk in it. Help me to emulate that sacrificial love that you showed us um, on that first Easter. So um, as the team come up, we'll just, I'd just like to pray. And uh, yeah, so would you like to stand? I'd just like to pray for the church. And Father, I just, I pray today, that, Lord, that, it would, that we would carry that love. Lord, I pray that it would go deep. Stir it into our lives, Lord, that we would not take it for granted. Lord, we would not just be another day, Lord, but no matter whatever life throws at us, Lord, and the chaos we see in this world, 
uh, but Lord, that we know we carry your resurrection power. Lord, we carry your life and your hope. Lord, that uh, you have freed us from the, the power of sin and, and death itself. Lord, we have hope, Lord, that, and Lord for the, that great feast in heaven that we will one day join in. We thank you for what you did on the cross. And Lord, I pray for, Lord, for this church, Lord, that we would carry that, um, that hope, that passion, day by day, Lord, as we go about um, this year. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yeah, bless you. And I encourage you, if you would like some prayer this morning, and you feel like, uh, actually, man, I, I just need to lay down some things. I, I, want, I want that fire and that passion back, and I, I need a resurrection myself, you know. Then I, if you want to respond to those words that came out, then I really encourage you to come forward. And would love to pray for healing as well. If there's any, you know, if the body's creaking a bit, <laughs> then uh, 